first thing I figured we would do is start with actually with a prayer and then um, also say a short prayer, uh, a Hail Mary for the uh, uh, satanic meeting that's actually going on back east. So. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee be happy and to Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Virgin most powerful, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. After Hugh's talk, and after we talked again last night, and if you do any kind of research into the effects and fallout in relationship to the evolutionary theory and hypothesis, what you begin to realize is that the import of the theory is grave. It not just affects all the different things in a geopolitical sense, but it's actually affecting virtually every aspect of Catholic life. In fact, if you actually look at a lot of the changes that were made in the church, it was all based on this attitude that modern man has changed and that we're developing and that there's this evolution and that there's, you know, that you can't go back, you can't maintain those things of the past, you have to move forward, and that things are progressing towards a better state. You know, we hear over and over and over again, but it's kind of, I suppose that was the silver lining to the whole pedophilia scandal, is the whole discussion about how it was the new springtime, that all came to an end. Right. The fact is, is that it's not a new springtime. The situation in the church has gotten rather dire and it's decayed. The question really becomes, though, is, is that why are the Orthodox priests and even the traditional priests who are Orthodox, why is it that they don't necessarily support or uphold the traditional doctrine on creation as we read in Genesis? Why is it that they tend to be theistic evolutionists and why is it that they tend not to actually support those who are trying to defend the church's traditional doctrine even when they see that it has a direct impact? So for example, if you, don't, if you believe in evolution, then in the end, uh, there's, as they've shown in discussions, there's no such thing as original sin. Well, if there's no such thing as original sin, just as Dawkins pointed out, then why did Christ ever in the end uh, uh, actually you know, hang upon the cross? It, it, once, it is a foundational doctrine. Once you remove it, the, the, the traditional doctrine of creation, then from that point on, the fact of the matter is, is that the entire Catholic theological edifice collapses, and that's what we've actually seen, right? And so it's, it's one of those key doctrines that if you don't maintain it, nothing else can be maintained. In fact, it's always funny because the first time I read about uh, the doctrine of original sin and actually about uh, the whole creation account was... Uh, my parents had kind of talked about it, but it wasn't until I actually had to memorize the Baltimore Catechism, the whole thing, in order to get co confirmed, right? So the first time I hear evolution, I'm like, this is just a fairy tale, right? I mean, it literally, it just made zero sense to me. Um, but I'm going to we circle back around to that, why I think I didn't see the, the theory of evolution as viable, why I didn't see it that way. And I think some of it has to do with my formation, but there's another key reason, which I'm gonna address when we come back to the end. So why is it that, those who, that um, those who should be defending the doctrine of creation do not give anything, and it's affected when we see the effect on the faith, on society, education, why is it that so even few traditional Catholic intellectuals among the clergy or laity are willing to actively defend the traditional doctrine of creation? Why? It should be, especially in light of the fact that the modern science and everything, if you actually look at the real science, and this is something that kind of shocked me as I started progressing and just kind of researching even the scientific end, many of the scientists that are the, at the top, not the ones you see in the media, but many of them that are at the very top of these, of the, um, of the echelon of scientific endeavors in their various fields, many of them don't believe in Darwin evolution at all, especially when you just start talking about the second law of thermodynamics. I mean, you just start, you just when they see this, and eh, it just doesn't work, 
right? But they don't say anything, and unfortunately right now, at least from what I can gather, I'm open to correction on this, but it seems what I can gather is that those that are perpetuating it are actually in the middle tier of the, there's a few at the top, but, but those are more agenda-driven, but it's the people in the middle tier of the academia. It's not the real intellectuals. The real intellectuals have a fundamental thing, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, and which is why in the end they just don't pay much attention to it although they do have to to some degree if they want to get funding. This conference is my own take on this. Again, I'm open to the discussion of this and open to criticism as to the why that there's not much of a defense, but not the fact there's so few priests that are willing to stand out there and say things. And I do know some that have preached against it and things like that, but there's so few that are willing to actually put their neck on the chopping block I think it really has to do with the fact that by the time most of the priests were formed in the last 40 to 50 years or even longer, by the time, we're going to see this in a minute, by the time you get to the 60s and 70s, modernism had infiltrated so many different facets of Catholic education, even in the seminaries, that by the time you get to that point, the fact that any man comes out of that not being a modernist heretic and rejecting the Catholic doctrine on evolution is almost miraculous. But I think it all really boils down to the fact that the modernism to go back has its roots in the foundation of rationalism. Now we've brought this up a few times, but I want to go into it a little deeper because this is where the fundamental problem is. Rationalism and the whole rationalist uh, endeavor and which God, of course, part, became part of the Enlightenment, etc. All of that is what's infiltrated the church. Rationalism, is, rationalism, which basically began with Descartes, which we talked a little bit about last night, and it's fundamentally rooted in two things. One is the uh, skepticism about the truth of what our senses tell us, and so it cuts us off from reality as being the foundation for our knowledge of the truth. The second component is founding the certitude of truth in my own thought. So it's not in reality, but it's what I think, and in a certain sense, even what I feel, becomes the, becomes the criteria for certitude. So rationalism, by that very fact that it cut us off from reality as the foundation of truth, meant that how we viewed revelation fundamentally changed. Rationalists do not believe that one can come to true intellectual knowledge of things, to come to nature, know the knowledge of nature of things through our senses. And as a result, that which pertains to the senses was systematically re rejected and ignored. It just, you didn't pay much attention, it didn't have any import or weight. Since revelation is something introduced into sensible reality, God talked to Moses communicated in sensible reality. Christ came and revealed everything in sensible reality. Everything is revealed in sensible reality. There are only a few things that were communicated to the apostles in the process of inspiration in relationship to scriptures or that were taught to them afterwards by illumination. But the fact of the matter is, is that a vast majority of every, all the essential doctrines basically um, that was necessary for salvation, but also many of the teachings of the church were introduced through sensible reality. This meant, therefore, that revelation, which comes in sensible reality, even the oral tradition of the church is through sensible reality, that gets cut off. And there is, technically speaking, no true revelation from God. They try and get him in the back door, though. If one is cut off from reality then one is locked up inside oneself, and so what pertains to one's experience becomes paramount. After Descartes came a guy by the name of Spinoza, and he systematically attacked the authenticity of the oral tradition regarding the scriptures and through his philosophy. So he was the guy that started just systematically denying any type of miraculous in scriptures cutting them down, trying to attack the veracity of their lineage as being passed from the apostles on, all of that. And as a result, it began to change people's worldview. As empiricism rose, which basically takes only what we can, ironically, what we can know through our senses as anything or, or actually our experience of concrete things, 
as the view of man became no a man became just viewed as purely a material being and this led to fixing man's meaning in the now in the present since for the empiricist man's meaning is found in what he senses and feels this led eventually to lack of interest in the past <coughs> since the past as such and the future for that matter cannot be sensed nor fulfill our, sen our sensible desires. With the advent of Hegel, now Hegel was the guy who started this process of saying that everything is, in, is changing and it's constantly changing, it can't help but change. He said, if you actually look at the world, he said, there was this thesis that is the current state of the world and its circumstances. Then what happens is arose an antithesis, which was the opposite of that, right? And then from that rose the, the, um, the synthesis, which included both, which violates the principle of contradiction, by the way, which is so elementary a way to just, just to say, well, obviously his theory is wrong. But it meant that for Hegel, in technically speaking, and this was true even for Spinoza, there was only one thing that existed, God. Spinoza, his actual reference to God is Deus sive natura. Now, you have to understand exactly what that means in Latin. Deus is, of course, God. Natura is nature. But sive means or, but it's a conjunctive or. It means God or what we would call nature. So they're, they're one and the same in his view. Hegel had the same view. The only difference is, is for Spinoza, it was static. It just never changed. Whereas for Hegel, God who entered into contact with the created order, it, or which you know, was only one thing, God, was in this constant state of flux, constantly changing. This is why even in Catholic circles who have adopted Hegelianism actually believe that God actually changes. This is why you'll hear things like, well, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. They're not different at all. We even see this creeping into even some of the most elementary doctrines of the church, You'll hear people say, God forgives and forgets. He can't forget. He can't change. He's eternal. It just means that his, uh, through his mercy, he no longer applies the justice to your sin. For all eternity, he's got to look at this. This gives you the, this is why we actually read in the Psalms, his mercy endures forever. So that when you get to heaven and he's forgiven it, it's for all eternity he's forgiving it, even though he sees it. So once Hegel shows up on the scene, the intellectual groundwork is laid for the wholesale lack of interest and interest of tradition. Because things are constantly changing, this thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and then the synthesis becomes the new thesis, then you have an antithesis, and this just keeps going on and on and on. The original state, what was originally revealed, and what we have now in their minds is completely different. And you have to basically look at them, or if it's not completely different, it's changed so much. And by the way, now they actually believe, and this was a hallmark of the theologians during the 50s, was that because of Hegelianism, it meant that every successive generation could not help but modify and change revelation in the passing and the teachings of the church as it passed on from one generation to another. This is why the prior generation, in my own opinion, is one of the most perverse, we call them the greatest, but it's one of the most perverse and degenerate generations that has ever existed in the history of the world. How do we know this? They took a church that was financially, spiritually, and morally at its prime and handed my generation of priests a church that is spiritually and morally and financially bankrupt. They could not leave a single thing alone. This is why Hegelianism and even this whole idea, which of course is just evolution, becomes part of this whole evolution of dogma, dogma right? And so they just can't, they literally, they couldn't leave a single thing. There's not a single thing in the church that they couldn't leave alone. And it's because there's this attitude of, well, each generation changes it. This is simply not true. One of the guarantees of Christ and through the Holy Spirit is that the doctrines of the church will remain incorrupt from the beginning until the end. It doesn't mean that certain magisterial members will say things contrary to the faith, but it means that they will remain incorrupt the church's teaching will never change because God never changes. Human nature doesn't change. Original sin doesn't change. 
Our need for forgiveness doesn't change. Our need for all these things doesn't change. And so what happens is, is that tradition it was looked at as something that's outmoded, outdated, and we needed to move beyond it, so there became a distrust of the tradition. As a consequence, those who wanted to impose some religious teaching based on tradition or history became suspect. They became ignored. At the same time in which the intellectual underpinnings for trusting tradition collapsed in the minds of modern intellectuals because of this whole theory of evolution creeping into even areas of dogma, under the impetus of modern philosophy, a growing immanentism arose from three sources. Now, immanentism comes from the two Latin words in and monere, which means to remain in. And it's the principle that basically holds, it's the foundational principle of modernism. While evolution is the, pri the principal doctrine, or a primary doctrine, it's the immanentism is the principle, it's the primary principle that undergirds all that. And it's the principle that basically says that the source of truth is not in reality. My mind isn't true because it conforms to reality. My mind is true because my thoughts don't contradict each other, as I mentioned last night. So this source of immanentism arose from three sources. The first was Kant, who through his epistemology was founded on Cartesian and empirical skepticism of the senses. But he left us locked in one's own mind, logically speaking. If you want to read a phenomenal book, although you have to be pretty knowledgeable in philosophy and theology. It's called um, God in Exile by Cornelio Fabro. In there he shows once you accept, once you accept the Cartesian cogito, once you accept it, and then he traces it through every single modern philosopher just about up to the present day, the trajectory is always atheism. Have you ever wondered why modernist clerics virtually never talk about God, that's why. They left, so they leave us locked in our own mind, it's no longer reality. This meant that everything is within ourselves and one's own mind, which means that man's experience becomes essential. Because in the end, everything remains in himself, man's experience. This is why you'll hear even priests say, well, we have to, have to make sure that the people have a good experience. Really? I don't think Christ was sitting there saying, you know, hang on this cross, I'm having quite the experience. <laughs> and it flies in the face of the entire spiritual tradition of the church, which basically means that the first thing that God does when he loves you is he makes your life miserable. Okay, how's that for experience? All right. The second source of immanentism was the location of the theological experience within the emotions. So first you have Kant, you got this intellectual just no longer following objective revelation and the magisteriums of uh, judications and judgments about what is contained in revelation. That was an objective standard to which is the rule of faith to which we must all conform. That ceased being the case. And then it then shifted to this imminentist thing. But in the end, given fallen human nature, the trajectory is that you're just going to follow your emotions. And that's where a guy by the name of Frederick Schleiermacher comes in. Now, Schleiermacher said that religion was primarily an expression of piety. Now, here he's not talking <coughs> about the piety. He's not talking about piety in the traditional sense, which is where you give honor to those who are above you or your parents primarily. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the emotional experience that we have when we do pious things, that is, go to church and things of this sort. And so, in the end, piety is found only in the emotions. Religion could not be satisfied with metaphysical treatises and analysis, he said. It, it is a rational ap approach to religion. That is, rather, it must be something emotional. This led to the immanentism of religion, since piety and religion ex ex experience was something within the individual. This basically degenerated into everything, even our liturgy to this day is now just imbued with making sure that people have a good experience. This is one of the fundamental reasons why they're losing the young. The reason they're using, losing the young is because emotion over the course of time, if, there, if, you, if, if the goal of the liturgy is to give me a nice emotional experience. The young are going to go play video games because they're going to get much more emotional excitement out of that. And so what happens is, is that we expect in the liturgy to conform the liturgy to people's emotional states. 
rather than the people conforming themselves to God, to an objective cult. And by that I mean the objective worship which conforms itself to God. Third, source which led to immanentism and therefore an intellectual formation for the acceptance only of the present and a rejection of the past was by Maurice Blondel. Blondel held that modern thought considers the notion of imminence as the very condition of philosophizing. In other words, truth is in my own mind, and if I'm going to philosophize, it has to be purely something that's in my own mind. That is to say, if among current ideas there is, this is uh, Blondel, if among current ideas there is one which regards as marking a definitive advance, see it's that evolution thing, it is the idea which at the very bottom perfectly true that nothing can enter into man's mind which does not come out of him and correspond in some way to a need for expansion and that there is nothing in the nature of historical traditional teaching or obligation imposed from without that counts for him. The tradition means nothing. Why would it? If everything is changing, if everything is evolving, you wouldn't even pay any attention to it. For Blondel, only those things which come from man himself and which are imminent to him have any meaning. No tradition or history has any bearing upon his intellectual considerations unless it is somehow comes from himself. These three sources of imminentism as they influence the church during the waning of the intellectual phase of modernism in the 1950s and early 1960s provided the foundation for a psychological break in, as tradition as the norm. Okay, again, this is all part of the evolution. If you actually look at the uh, her modernist heresy, it actually had four phases. We're actually in the fifth. The first four is the initial phase began around 1832 when it was called liberalism until the beginning of the First Vatican Council, 1869. There are very distinctive things that they were dealing with in the First Vatican Council, which unfortunately got cut short because of the Franco-Prussian War, which hopefully, or should it had been properly, the remaining scheme had been properly dealt with, a lot of this stuff we wouldn't be dealing with. But it terminates then the second phase was called the intelligentsia phase. This begins from after the, second or the first Vatican Council and goes up to the condemnation of Pius X when he formally condemns modernism. So that begins the intelligentsia phase. It's during that phase that you see, especially the scriptural studies, all this stuff starts really creeping in heavily, much more heavily into the Catholic intelligentsia. Then from 1907 until 1955 or 60, roughly, is the underground phase. The intelligentsia were still completely influenced by it, but they started influencing the upcoming seminarians and stuff. Look at the collapse in the church didn't come out of a vacuum. The call for massive changes in the discipline of the church and its liturgy and all these things didn't come out of a vacuum. It came because all this stuff was actually being developed underneath. It's also during that time frame that you see people like Chardin and all these guys start to get to come to the surface and get a certain kind of a name. And it was underground because of the fact that if you got caught being a modernist, you could get booted out of the seminary. And then we entered in after, so after from about 1955, 60, the intellectual gas of modernism starts to run out. And so then you end up in a superficial phase where they're just saying stuff that's just daft. Over the course of time, that lack of intellectual depth, and that is that the intellectual shallowness eventually doesn't satisfy people. So over the course of 50 years, they began to lose the intellectual argument in relationship to orthodoxy, because as the orthodox priests and clergy and theologians began defending the orthodox position on a variety of different things, what happened was is that they, they couldn't defend their position because they just got mopped up intellectually, and so the only thing left now is force. And so now we're in that phase, where they're just trying to cram this stuff down and they're trying to make changes permanent. How do you make changes permanent? The next guy can come in and change them. But this is this, this is this mindset of we, we have to keep moving forward and we can't go back because in the Hegelian dialectic, you can never go back to the original thesis in that process. You always go through the antithesis and the synthesis and the synthesis can never go back to the original uh, thesis. Blondell was working at a time when the church was just become, coming to the conscious 
the conscious awareness of the fact that it was heading for a definitive break with the tradition. The work of Vlandel and the influx of all the modern philosophical views which were antithetical to ecclesiastical tradition had a drastic impact on the church. Blondell and others, under the influence of modern philosophy, thought that modern man could not be satisfied by past ways of thinking. We have to move beyond this. We have to evolve past it. They provided an intellectual foundation upon which the church, with the council as a catalyst, would update itself or undergo an adjournamento. With the foundations for the extrinsic tradition, that is the very tradition of the church, having been supplanted, the tradition was lost. In other words, the new view of man had changed. And since the view of the deposit was subjected to modern analysis, the deposit of faith is what's passed on through the tradition, the tradition which rested upon these two collapsed. We are currently living in the full-blown effects of that collapse. The members of the church today have become fixated on the here and now and the past traditions are not only irrelevant, but are be distrusted and even demonized. We see this even with the whole thing. The number of Catholics that actually subscribe to gay marriage is profound, even though this is completely contrary to the entire tradition of the church, completely contrary to the entire Judeo-Christian history. Hence, when you, so if you look at this, all of this is collapsed. And so even traditional priests, even Orthodox priests, are growing up in the ambient of modernism and the principle of eminence, where we ourselves become the objective principle um, by which we judge things, these things rather than the objective criteria and what the tradition has always said. That means that when it comes to the traditional understanding of the Genesis account or of creation, that too is subject to this very same thing. It's not believed because it's part of the tradition. In other words, what most people don't seem to grasp is that modernism is such a toxic heresy. It is so toxic. And by that I mean it's so much in the air. The odds of people not having modernist thinking somewhere in their thought is astronomical. And I'll be honest with you, I've only met probably about 10 people in my entire life that I could say this person doesn't suffer from modernism. Only 10. It's everywhere. And this meant that even the priests that were growing up and, and be, going through their formative years, they all got exposed to this. And so even when they come into the tradition, that's still part of their intellectual formation. See, what most people don't realize, although the communists seem to have realized this very early on, is that if you get children when they're very young and you start forming them, they start creating intellectual habits which determine how they judge things. And that determination on how they judge stuff, even if they, they recognize what you're telling them is false, that habit is still there and it takes a long time to undo that habit. And a lot of times it doesn't get undone and that's what we're living in. The reason many Orthodox priests and bishops don't come to the defense of the traditional doctrine on creation is precisely because their intellectual habits still cause the emotional reactions when they hear it. It's this, it's this fear or revulsion that they get because that's how they were trained. That, oh, that's just ridiculous. Only children think that when actually the real fable is the, is the evolution. Modernism and the principle of evidence, as I mentioned, is such a topic, toxic heresy. And I think, again, it's the reason why so many traditional priests don't do it, because in the end, many of them are so, have even bits and pieces, even in their thinking, it's still modernist. And I don't mean to discourage our love and devotion for them, but the fact is, is that this is one of the things that's happening. Part of it is that they are ignorant of the tradition itself. They, don't, they haven't studied the tradition. This is the beauty of all the work that Hugh has done and has actually produced is the fact that the tradition is coming alive again so people can actually read this and actually get a sense of it. People act like evolution is this new theory. Well, St. Paul says there's nothing new under the sun. These, it, uh, granted, it's the product of a, of a tremendous philosophical pedigree in, in modern age, but this idea that things are changing, conscience changing, etc., this has been around forever. 
It's, they act like the fathers of the church didn't have any knowledge about this in light of, of the creation account. They fully knew all the different theories of Democritus and all these guys that, that had come up with alternative theories. They knew all that stuff, yet they knew this, what God has revealed, is what is to be held. Then, if you look at the history of modernism and this influx of bad philosophy... The church went through a series of collapses. Most of them were unperceptible. But if you go back and look at the literature over the last 150 to 170 years, you can see distinctive shifts that start to occur within the context of Catholic thinking. And the first shift, the first collapse that happened is by the late 1800s, uh, a full-blown collapse had occurred in relationship to Scripture. I mentioned Spinoza, who systematically attacked the authenticity of the oral tradition regarding the scriptures. In fact, Spinoza, who lived, even though, even though he lived much earlier than that, he held, as I mentioned, that there was only one thing. But the point is, is that he was the one who basically, he even got excommunicated by the Jews, he was so bad. But he was the one that began this process of dissembling the of scriptures. This left most of Scripture in the eyes of academics as not a reliable source. He had dis- dissembled it, and part of this had to do with the fact that by the time you get... So it, a very fascinating thing. It's, it's just a little bit before the First Vatican Council and after the Second Vatican Council, there's this collapse among the recognition that Scripture is divinely inspired. And a lot of that had to do with there was also an attack on the very nature of inspiration itself. Pius XII recognized the necessity to actually give a definition of it. And in the definition, if you look at it, he says that in the end, God is responsible for every single word in the original text of divine ins- that were divinely inspired. He communicates that knowledge to the author, but the author, it's God who is responsible for ultimately what is produced, because he can determine what the author writes or not. But what happened is, is they started shifting and basically not believing in divine inspiration, and so this ends up, this ends up collapsing. So the first thing that collapses is scripture. This is why evolution starts making quite a bit of headway in relationship to Catholic scholars. This is why by the time you get to the 1950s, it's already imbued in, in the thinking of these people. Once the scripture collapsed, the next collapse happened in the early 1900s. This is when ecclesiology collapsed. So if you actually look, okay, so let's back up. It's interesting that if you want to read some of the most profound, detailed working out of what divine inspiration is and precisely how it works, it was actually being done by the theologians after the First Vatican Council up until about 1910. Because that was the debate. They knew that that was a key hinge, and they had worked it out based upon the writings of uh, Augustine and then, of course, the subsequent tradition. Augustine plays a key role in all that. But this is one of those things where they had worked it out, but it got systematically ignored. Why? Because the intelligentsia, who is now in charge of basically the, the various academic institutions that were infiltrated in the institutions, made sure that that understanding, the scholastic understanding of precisely how inspiration worked and therefore how we we're going to read Genesis, that they made sure that never saw the light of day. So then the ecclesiology collapses. This is when you start hearing people say that the Catholic Church is not the only divinely established means of salvation. And you start to see it creep in primarily from the branch theory started by the the Protestants because they didn't like the idea that the Catholic Church was claiming it was the only true church. And so they had to come up with something to kind of get their foot in the door. And so you see at First Vatican Council, they actually say it's a formally defined teaching of the church that the principle of unity, you cannot be in the church which Christ established unless you are in union with the papacy. It says it, that's a formally defined fact. The, princi- the papacy is the principle of unity in the church. But then there was a shift because of this whole um, branch theory, and it started working into the modernists. Again, this is where the development of dogma, you even hear people say this. This is a formally defined thing. 
You cannot be Catholic and reject that teaching of the First Vatican Council, but by the time you get to the Second Vatican Council, the ecclesiology had shifted to where now the principle of unity was no longer the papacy, but the episcopate. A very subtle shift occurs, but it's gargantuan, and this is why they say things are developing. This is why they say you can be saved and not be a member of the church, right? But then also, then, so scripture collapses, you have an ecclesiological collapse, an understanding of what the actual church is, which makes sense, because once uh, scripture is gone, well then what St. Paul says about the, the mystical body of Christ is all shot. And then the next thing that happens is it starts to creep in in the 30s, but the, by the time you get to the 1950s, there's a, there's a collapse of the natural law understanding of the foundation of morality in the Catholic Church. So you can actually see that there's shifts in the, um, the manuals during that time where it's very clear in the 30s and 40s that there are certain things, certain acts that are considered against the sixth commandment. It's even within the context of marriage and the church is very clear about them. But by the time you get to the 50s, that natural law underpinning for that collapsed. And so now you have some theologians in the 1950s allowing acts which the church had said were not contra naturum. They're disordered intrinsically. So that by the time you get to the Second Vatican Council, so all this progression is happening. There's this devolving that's occurring within the church. By the time you get to the Second Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council wasn't the cause. It was the catalyst. It was the moment that they seized in order to blow all this stuff out, right? And so this is why after the Second Vatican Council, in fact, if you can even read it in the documentation, even while the Second Vatican Council is going on, the theologians, who are basically modernist heretics, were running back to their diocese, telling the lay faithful, because at the third session of the Second Vatican Council, they were arguing over whether contraception was going to be allowed. Paul VI pulled it from the floor because it got so heated, and that's why he put out, he himself, put out Humanae Vitae, but, it's by, the, but by this time, the toothpaste was out of the tube. These guys were running back to their diocese saying you can contracept because the church is going to change its position. Why? Because dogma evolves. So once the scripture collapses, all of the, the, the foundation of the church's teaching on that collapses. The relationship between the evolutionary hypothesis and historicity of the first three chapters of Genesis has a long and involved history but the Pontifical Biblical Commission had already made the ruling. Now, this was back when the Pontifical Biblical Commission was actually part of the magisterium. And so this is when they basically said that these things are to be interpreted as actual history. There was a widespread rejection of the literal sense of the first three books of Genesis by the denial of the proposition that the first three books of Genesis contained actual historical events. They, it was re being rejected, and the Bond Pacifical Biblical Commission came out and said no. The rejection of the histori historicity of the first three books of Genesis is motivated by a basic worldliness, though. And by that is meant a desire to conform scriptures and theology to the hypothesis present within the world and by the scientific community of the day. It was an inversion of the process that should have occurred. In fact, the entire history of the church, the scholastics actually talk about this, that you can actually know that your natural science is actually less likely to be erroneous as long as it doesn't contradict what the church knows to be actually true doctrinally. Why? It's very simple. God cannot fail as a cause because he's omnipotent. In fact, God's ability to bring a thing into existence, he just has to think it exists and boom, it's in existence. He doesn't have to work at it. He doesn't have to do anything. And so what this means is, is that in relationship to the faith that he infuses in your mind at the time of your baptism, it's in your intellect, and then the cause of him on the side of revelation, on the side of the cause, those two things are absolutely certain. This means that what we read in revelation and what we read in scripture is absolutely certain because he is its cause. The difficulty comes on the side of the individual, which I'm going to return back to this. 
So that means that if you come up with a hypothesis in your natural science that contradicts what we know on the side of what God revealed, you're wrong. It's that simple. This is what the scholastics talk about how even though we don't use revelation as the primary means in the empirical sciences, it's a great check to keep us in order so that we don't end up stepping outside our bounds. This is why we read in the documents of Vatican I, we also reject and condemn by an anathema the doctrine which asserts the treatment of the natural and rational sciences so that they were necessary to be of their own right and plainly independent. That propositions which in them are established and deduced, although contrary to the Catholic doctrine, are not under the judgment and authentic prescription of the church, and therefore the natural and rational sciences also with their differences are to be treated as errors contrary to the Catholic faith and doctrine which bear no resemblance to supernatural revelation. Essentially what the church has defined is that it is entirely within its right to pass judgment on the propositions of the natural sciences if these propositions are contrary to Catholic doctrine. This means that it is within the right of the church to pass judgment on those aspects of the evolutionary hypothesis which are contrary to Catholic doctrine. Vatican I goes on to say, if anyone says that it is possible that at some point, at some point in time, given the advance of science, a sense may be assigned to the dogmas propounded by the church which is different from that which the church has understood and understands, let him be anathema. Essentially what the church is saying is that between the two citations is that if a natural rational science concludes something that is contrary to the faith, the natural rational science is to be considered in error. Because why? Because the source of our knowledge of these things from God who revealed them and on the side of our faith it's more certain. It doesn't mean that we, because of our subjective defects and things like that, don't struggle a little bit with our faith, but on the side of the cause, they're certain, especially in relationship to revelation. And therefore, if something contradicts revelation, it is to be considered in error, because God can neither deceive nor be deceived. The church is not to be expected to conform its teachings regarding doctrine to the hypothesis of the natural or rational sciences. Especially, the, especially if you look at it. If the church is gonna conform itself to the teachings of the empirical sciences, it would be all over the map. Because, you know, it's, it's like you say, well, we, we, they, they, and this is my complaint. I would have less of a difficulty if they just proposed something as a hypothesis or as a theory. But what happens is, is they post something, as I mentioned last night, where it's absolute dogma, and then, Five months later, 10 years later, well, that's out. Now this is the new dogma. It's literally a religion with these people. You know, this, the, you know, the age of the universe was like this dogma set in stone. Well, now it's changed because they're like, okay, we got data that doesn't line out with this. But that should tell them that when it comes to these things, the principle of evidence which states that the degree of certitude has to be based on the evidence should tell them that, look, our evidence is such that it's we're not going to have the degree of certitude that we would have from our faith, from what God has revealed. Part of the reason has to do with the greater, where the greater certainty lies. See, Descartes thought that the greater certainty lied in mathematics or in the rational sciences, but in point in fact, on the side of the cause, it resides in theology. Regarding matters of faith, many of them are actually more certain than those things which pertain to the natural sciences. St. Thomas says, quote, nothing prohibits that which is more certain according to nature to be, uh, to be with respect to us less certain because of the weakness of our intellect, which relates to those things most manifest in nature as the eye of the owl to the light of the sun. Hence the doubt which happens in some people about the articles of faith is not because of the incertitude of the thing, why? Because God caused revelation. God caused creation to be done in the manner in which he revealed in Scripture because he is the author of the Scripture and is responsible, according to Pius XII, for every word. And so that is more certain on the side of the cause. It's not because of the incertitude of the thing, 
but because of the weakness of the human intellect. This is precisely why we need a source like the church to tell us, don't do this, this isn't true, this isn't correct. On the side of those who want to be able to conform Catholic doctrine and the scriptures to evolutionary hypothesis to what has now known become as continuous creation, so now we've got that, they admit that the concept, so this is the theistic evolutionists, they admit that the concept of con continuous creation does not appear to be in the text of the magisterium of the church. You can't find it anywhere. There's nowhere where it says in the magisterium of the church that there's this continuous creation. It is not present among the medievals. It's not in the fathers of the church. But one is able to find express precursors, they argue. Oh, well, there's some of this stuff was there. Usually they point to St. Augustine, but Hugh's got a great analysis of that. Effectively speaking, they admit that the idea of continuous creation, which is necessary for theistic evolution, in which God must continue to create new creatures, even from the initial creation at the beginning, is not found anywhere in the magisterium of the church, among the medieval theological schools, or in the fathers of the church. Now, if you've read anything of mine, you know that when the fathers of the church are unanimous, or the theological schools, that is the theologians of the theological schools from 1100 to 1750 are unanimous at something's of the faith, or that it's formally defined by the, by the church in its magisterium, then it's infallible. There's not a single doctor of the church that would subscribe to evolution, or especially among the fathers. This would be the end of the, this should be the end of the discussion right there. However, the motivation behind wanting to conform the interpretation of the first three books of Genesis to the evolutionary theory is driven by a desire to conform Catholic doctrine and scriptures, etc., as much as possible to the natural and rational sciences out of pure, unadulterated human respect. That's what's at the root of it. Theistic evolution has already been addressed by basis last night as I talked about how it violates the principle of economy. However, it should be noticed that in a notion of continuous creation, which dealt with more below, essentially asserts that there's constant miracles happening because nature can't beget this higher thing. So God has to suspend the laws of nature and bring up this higher thing each at each and every step. However, the very nature of a miracle is that it's the exception, not the rule because it is a suspension of the laws of nature, and God normally rules through the laws of nature. Creation by its definition of bringing something out of nothing on the part of God is a miracle, and therefore is not the rule. It's the thing that he does exceptionally, it's the preservation and being, the conservation of these things, and the providence of these things through the natural order is the rule. It is for this reason that St. Thomas says that God acts in every way by conserving and administering the established creature, not, however, in creating a new one. When one considers the rational sciences, namely philosophy, specifically after the time of Descartes, but include Hegel and Hume and the like, there's a few things that one is kind of struck with. The first is the fact that many who were proponents of evolutionary hypothesis were deists, for example, James Hutton, John Baptiste de Lamarck, Charles Darwin, and Charles Lyell, among others. These were all deists. And deis, deism is a philosophical system which, God, which states that God created the world initially and then he backs away and has nothing left to do with it. And so it just kind of goes on its own. One can see how the evolutionary hypothesis rose out of this philosophical framework, which is essentially a theological error, but it's also a philosophical error. They wanted to exclude God. So as far as those who should be teaching creation and not evolution, there is a human, a human respect element that's involved. This is what we're dealing with, it's human respect. It's the same reason why one of the fundamental mistakes in my own estimation, even though I have six academic degrees in philosophy and theology, is the church never should have started awarding degrees. They only, and by here I mean, you know, in the seminary, and the, because the reason was, is that, and this was a, something that was actually going on in the 1950s, is, is that all the academics wanted to have a credibility in the eyes of their secular counterparts by having degrees. But it was that same human respect driving that, but also driving to wanting to conform the church's teaching to the modern theories. 
but it is also because of their subscribe to modern philosophical ideas where there's an exaggerated certitude in the empirical sciences. If anything has shown us in the last four years regarding COVID, all of that is that the science ain't settled, right? It's changing. It doesn't mean it doesn't have value. It doesn't mean that we're not learning. It just means that it's not as settled as they like to make it out to be. That the members of the church cannot pass judgment on the empirical and natural sciences is also something that imbued their minds. Many traditional priests, and even traditionalists, even members of the magisterium, are men of the modern era, and so scientism rules the day, even though they don't realize it. They've, they've, they've breathed in the toxic air, as I mentioned. Scientism seems to be true because of technology, because they're producing wonderful things, right? But these are distinct from the theology, or the, sorry, the theory behind how these things work. The theory behind technology and how to advance is different from the actual ability to produce it. Also, technology may in, may in, in, and in itself is also a problem. There is a subtle disbelief in the truth of the philosophical and theological sciences, despite the fact that the very definition of science, as I mentioned last night, comes from philosophy. And the entire empirical scientific endeavor is based on philosophical presumptions. This is why they tend to follow evolution, because it comes from a science that has been taught as more certain than philosophy and theology. It's a credibility issue. You're not credible unless you sign off on these guys' theory they're going to think you're ridiculous. One time when I actually had just published my book on psychology, I made the observation that some of the acts that human beings perform are not material. They're not subject to being tested in a lab. As a result of that, if a, if a psychology intentionally neglects and denies that there are activities of human beings that, such as free will, certain acts of the intellect, like judgment and things of this sort, that they deny those things exist and proceed, it's not a valid science. One of the guys came up to me and he said, don't, don't, you know, you should take that out of there. You don't want to say that. I'm like, why? And he says, well, people aren't going to believe you. I'm like, well, that's not the issue. The issue is, is did I write what is true or not? And this is the same problem that we're actually seeing in relationship to evolution and all of this. They want that credibility in the eyes of the world. As I mentioned, there are certain facts of philosophy that are more certain than even the empirical sciences. There is also an implicit adoption of Descartes' idea that man, because of reason and that exaggerated uh, thinking that reason can grace, gain certitude if it just follows the right method, will discover all truths about nature. Now, there's a rather lengthy quote I want to give you from St. Thomas, and I know that this has been a bit of a burden. You're getting a lot of This has been information download, I agree. But there are a few things that I think are important for us to see the context of why nobody's defending this. So here's the quote from St. Thomas. That the world was not always was is held only by faith and is not able to be demonstrated as also above it was said of the mystery of the Trinity, then the reason is that the newness of the world is not able to be demonstrated on the part of the world itself. So what he just got done saying is, the world itself does not contain sufficient evidence for us to know its origins perfectly. For the principle of demonstration is that which is. In other words, it's reality. However, each thing according to the notion of its species is abstracted from the here and now because of what it is said that the universals are everywhere and always. So this goes back to the idea that the natures of things are eternal. They never change. Hence, it is not able to be demonstrated that man or the heavens or a stone not always was. So you can't prove by the natural light of reason certain things in relationship to the created order. Similarly, also, neither on the part of the agent, which acts through the will. For the will of God is not able to be investigated by reason except about that which is absolutely necessary for God to will. However, this does not apply to creatures. The divine will is able to be manifested to man, however, by revelation, on which faith depends. 
Hence, it is credible that the world began to be. However, it is not demonstrable or knowable. What has he just got done saying? He just got done saying that the only way that we can know the true origins of the world with clarity and certainty is by divine revelation because the actual things themselves in the created order do not contain sufficient information about their origins. And this is useful to be considered, at least perhaps someone presumed to be demonstrated it is of the faith does not induce necessary reasons, which offer material to the laughter of infidels judging us because of their reasons to believe that they are of the faith. So what St. Thomas is saying is that the world began to be and was created new is not something that we can presume to be demonstrated by the natural light of reason. Let's translate that. The empirical sciences are not going to be able to give us a, law, a clear understanding of the precise origins and in how it all went down purely by the evidence that's there because the universe doesn't contain enough information. So if we start to argue that it does, that you can prove that the world began at a certain time, he says you're gonna end up being, that you can prove it by the natural light of reason, what's gonna happen is that it started at a specific point because he's actually addressing um, uh, Anselm here, I think, I think it was Anselm. Maybe it was Ambrose. No, it was Bonaventure, sorry. He was addressing Bonaventure. Because Bonaventure said you can actually prove by the natural light of reason that it had a beginning in the point of time. And he's like, well, look, it, you can't necessarily prove that because it doesn't contain enough information. When considering the discussion at hand, this essentially means that we can only have certitude regarding many matters pertaining to creation by the light of faith in which the church has defined, such as God creating things out of nothing. This does not mean that we do not hold that the world depends on God as a cause for its existence, because you can prove that God exists based upon the world, right? It does not mean that you cannot use arguments and demonstrations to show that the evolutionary hypothesis is untenable, because as Hugh just got done showing, even though we can't prove special creation through the natural light of reason and must hold it by faith. Nevertheless, once we hold it by faith, it becomes clear that the created order lines out with that, even though it doesn't contain all the information to, to give us certitude about it, then that's why it has to come from faith. We can also know, however, that if you look at the actual evidence, that it's not only against revelation, but it's actually against what we see in the created order itself, because the created order itself does not contain the evidence that supports evolution. What is important to note here is that how things began, that is how things were created can only be known through revelation because the creation itself, the natural world, as I mentioned, doesn't continue, contain sufficient information to deduce how it came to be. St. Thomas says in his Summa, he says, the inception of the world cannot be demonstrated from the standpoint of the world itself. This is the folly of all these guys in the empirical sciences trying to give an explanation of it based purely on what's contained in the natural order. This is one of the reasons why, I must admit, I want to get popcorn and just sit back and click the, the internet and watch all these videos about everybody panicking about all the discoveries of the James uh, World tel or the James Space Telescope, right? James Webb Space Telescope. Because every time you turn around, they're like, oh no, now we got this. The data is contradicting what they're saying, right? And it's bound to, because it, it, whereas if you held to a special creation, whatever you discover through the natural light of reason is going to nine out with that special creation. Whereas if you hold that there is this evolution, you're going to end up coming with all sorts of data that is going to be contrary to it. So what does this mean in relationship to those who don't want to defend it? Well, many priests have adopted Descartes' ideas, and they also are creatures that very often are subject to human respect. They don't want to look like an idiot. I mean, <laughs> in the very beginning when I was just going after evolution and showing how it was uh, just ridiculous and it just didn't, and it, you know, and it, this brings us back to my original observation. How is it, 
how is it that I actually saw that evolution was just silly, was the fact that in addition to the right formation, I had the right catechetical upbringing. We have to teach our children clearly in the very beginning, the initial steps are, this is how God created the heavens and the earth. And we take them through scripture and we show that this is exactly how these things handled sequentially. Once they start getting older, you have to introduce them to the ideas of evolution to rebut them, so, but they have to have that habit of thinking in their minds of judging things a proper way so that when they get to looking at evolution, they can see the truth of the criticism of it that it doesn't hold water. If you just introduce them to both, then you've got a problem. Like all theological truths, we cannot prove through the natural light of reason the Genesis account. Again, we can only know it by, by faith. But you have to realize that most priests have adopted this attitude of Descartes. And it, I think what it really boils down to is it's a lack of moderation. It's a sign of a moral problem. One of the things that we have to do is we have to curtail or rein in our intellect's desire to know. The vice of curiosity is the desire to know those things that are not proper to our state in life. I don't need to know who Angela Jolene is dating. I don't need to know, you know, whether Alex Baldwin is going to be prosecuted or not. I don't need to know any of that. It's a waste of my time. What I need to know is what, is, what does the Catholic Church teach about X, Y, and Z? Right? That's what I need to know. But what happens is, is that there is in the human intellect not just a desire to know a thing, but to know it with certitude. And there are certain things that I complained last night about the lack of precision. Evolutionary hypothesis and theory is precisely gained ground because of a lack of intellectual precision. If you follow the first principles, and if you follow the principle of evidence very closely, it does not bring you to evolution. And so this is one of the reasons, and it's precisely, and why? Because people want to have certitude from something tangible. They want to be able to look at the evidence. And when you give evidence more certitude than it actually admits, this is why we have people telling us it's only going to take two weeks to flatten the curve. This is why they're going to tell us that it's going to ameliorate the, this. Why we have them telling us that a man can be a woman right? It's it, it, because they're looking for certitude in an excessive manner. And then, and that's because they're not reining in, in their appetites. But then that also means that their appetites are going to be pursue a certain thing. So the principle of imminence, which basically de degenerates into emotion, emotionally we want that certitude, and so we're going to be giving things more certitude than they actually have. And I think that's a large part of why people subscribe to evolution. They want it to have more certitude because then they can be intellectually satisfied. When in point in fact, if you actually look at special creation, it indicates a more, it gives you a greater intellectual satisfaction. The failing on the side of some traditions is because they believe that to hold to the Genesis account despite what the Pontifical Bible Commission judged is basically fundamentalism. Even in some of the current magisterium, even the best of them fear of saying anything that seems to be fundamentalist, especially in regard to the first three chapters of Genesis. Don't want to do that. We don't want to look ridiculous. Well, how about just looking like you're telling the truth? Right? The problem lies in acquiescing to holding that Genesis account is somehow fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is defined as a movement of the 20th century Protestantism emphasizing the literal interpretation of the Bible as fundamental to Christian life and belief. Fundamentalism tends to take scriptures literally when they're not supposed to be. For example, upon this rock I will build my church. Now, Peter ain't a rock. Sometimes he seemed to be a blockhead, but he wasn't a rock. 
But then there's also a time in which the magisterium has to tell us, based upon the tradition of the church, when it is to be taken literally. My bo- this is my body. John 6 is literally true from the entire tradition, and therefore it's not fundamentalism to take that as literally true. And this is one of the reasons why the church had to step in and say, no, what happened in Genesis is actually historically true. They had to step in and say, this is the progression. But when it comes to the Genesis account, we are bound to hold to its literal sense according to the Pontifical Biblical Commission, which at the time of its ruling was part of the magisterium. But they're simply reflecting, and this is the thing we have to remember, they're simply reflecting the entire tradition of the church. But herein lies another attitude problem. If things are progressing, and if the Hegelian dialectic is true, and we're all evolving towards this omega point, according to Teilhard, but we're all advancing to a better state, then that means that modern man is better than his superiors. I call it the modern man superiority complex. We think today that somehow or another we're superior to those who went before us. Well, one of the things that genetic entropy shows us is, is that we're getting dumber, as I mentioned last night. There are certain things that we don't know. Even the, I mean, it's astounding. I mean, just my, I'm actually in the process of compiling a book. It's just called Shop Talk. It's the one-liners from my father. He was a master at these things. You know, he would just like throw out like, he would just, he just, uh, I'll hold off so that you have to buy the book, right? <laughs> but you just realize that their form, not just their formation, but even you can see that intellectually we're degrading. But the problem is, is that modern man, some traditionists, not all, of course, but most members of the current magisterium think that the people in the past were stupid, unintelligent, uneducated. They just didn't know any better. We know better. I'll give you a perfect example. The modern scripture scholarship says, well, you know, the, uh, the reason why we actually think that the scriptures were originally written in, in um in uh, Greek is because of the lineages of the various scriptures, and they never had an understanding in the past of the lineages of the various scriptural texts, and so that's why they never really realized what we did, because we're so much more intelligent, that they were originally written in Greek and Hebrew. Hello. There was a protracted, long, drawn-out discussion at the Council of Trent and afterwards over that exact issue because the Protestants were changing scriptures and the Catholic Church settled on the Vulgate as the only scriptural line that they had certitude about its lineage. People say, well, in the original Greek. There is no such thing as the original Greek. We have later manuscripts. Well, in the original Hebrew, there is no original Hebrew. What we do know is that Jerome had first-generation copies of the original Hebrews of the Gospels which were originally written in Hebrew, if you read tradition and actually study it properly. The reason, the point being is, is that they, so they just act like that somehow or another our ancestors were just stupid and somehow we didn't understand these things. Do you honestly believe that St. Augustine, who wrote an entire tract on scripture, didn't understand that there were difficulties in interpretations of certain passages and the fact that sometimes they were recounted slightly differently in the gospels? You know, they just act like everybody in this past was stupid. Meanwhile, our intelligence keeps degrading. Furthermore, so they, that sometimes even the traditions kind of think, well, you know, that was then. They kind of succumb to that. They don't necessarily think that, but that's in their thinking. Part of the reason of the magisterium not defending the traditional creation account is because of the rejection and not adherence to the principle of the integral good of the greatest generation. If you pay very close attention to the moral manuals and to things that were written after 1960, if you pay very close attention to their discussion of evolution, and if you pay very close attention to their discussion of ecclesiology, the greatest generation did not believe in the principle of the integral good. They didn't believe in it. In the end, we can ultimately boil down to fear. They did not want to be seen as stupid, backward, not up to date, anachronistic, unscientific. They didn't want to be seen as unintelligent and just not with it. 
rather than the real issue, which is at the very root of it is this real moral problem. It's an unwillingness to follow the truth regardless of the personal cost. To adhere to special creation requires suffering. Just like it is in a time when there's a lot of heresy, those who subscribe to the heresy ridicule and downplay and persecute those who adhere to what the church has always held. It's the same thing. But there has to be a willingness to follow the truth regardless of the personal cost. And so in the end, it's just a lack of fortitude and a lack of truthfulness and bad intellectual formation. They don't want to stand out. We must have the fortitude, but also the willingness to adhere to reality. I'm willing to follow the truth regardless of the personal cost, because in the end, that's what perfects my intellect. St. Thomas says that the truth is the good of the intellect. Not what I want, not what seems nice, but what is the actual truth? And that means my mind, I, my mind becomes perfected when it adheres to reality, not to my emotions. And this is one of the things that we have to do. Now, what does this mean? Because if we're going to say that this, this in unwillingness to actually follow this is one of the reasons why evolution is, is, has, has basically taken over. It's in virtually every facet of the church's teachings these days. Not the churches, but people that are part of the church. <clears throat> it boils down to one fundamental thing. Even though we must mount a tremendous defense of special creation and at least show that evolution is not a viable hypothesis. We have to do that, even in relationship to the secular world. We have to defend the truth and we have to show that they're on the wrong track, if for no other reason than pure charity for them. But it also means something very fundamental, which I've talked about in another conference, and that is, so goes the church, goes the world. The fact that this stuff collapsed in the church means that the graces to adhere to special creation is not going to be flooded into the world until the church gets its act together. To see, and this I think goes back ultimately, the clarity when I first time I heard evolution, the clarity that I had that that was fundamentally false and that, uh, that special creation is so clearly true and so much better was, I think, grace. It's not me. It's nothing special about me. I'll be the first to admit, as my conference on singularity is, I'm not special. It's not me. It's grace. To see these things requires a grace, and God gives that grace, but you have to be two things. Grace comes through hearing. This is one of the reasons why conferences like this are so important. But the other side of it is, is there, there has to be a response to that grace, and we have to merit that grace. We have to start praying for our clergy to be faithful to the church's tradition in this regard, to the magisterium's faithfulness to the tradition in this regard. And once we do that, once the church becomes faithful to what it has been given by God, then we can see the grace will be merited for the rest of the world because all grace comes into the world by means of the Catholic Church. It does not mean that only Catholics get grace. It means, though, that the Catholic Church, which is the mystical body of Christ, is in fact the, the grace that through which all grace comes. And so we have to merit the grace for the secular world to abandon this, this error, this fundamental error. And they're not going to abandon it until we do our part. But we have to start with our own clergy. We have to be praying, doing prayers, sufferings, and good works for their conversion in this regard, if nothing else, or at least to get the grace to be willing to adhere to it and to defend it. Okay. okay. So there were a few questions from last night that I wanted to address that uh, kind of came in, which I think are actually uh, worth taking a look at. The first one is, um, yes, speech has gotten very sloppy. Uh, people's thinking and speech has gotten imprecise. Um, but it's not restricted just to that, uh, to free speech. So is not free speech the death of all sciences? Long term it is. In fact, what most people are unaware of is that the church actually condemned um, the uh, uh, free, freedom of speech. 
And the reason it condemned it, that they said, is because in the end, you can't protect the common good. Where the freedom lies is in the freedom to always tell the truth, not to say whatever you want, but to tell the truth is where the freedom truly lies. Okay. Uh, I heard today that the papers are being prepared to allow divorce and remarry to receive the Holy Eucharist without change of circumstances or repentance. How do I explain this to my children as I have newer remarried and taught them the father is living in adultery? Well, it basically boils down to one fundamental thing is, is that the church's teaching regarding these matters does not change. And so even if they were to put something like that out, the entire tradition of the church has always taught that. Um, you cannot be validly married and your other spouse still al and your spouse be alive and you remarry someone else. That's adultery. So, and, whereas an annulment basically states that from the very beginning there was no marriage, and so you, the church once it declares that, then you can remarry, and that's technically speaking not remarried because technically speaking you weren't married in the beginning. Okay. So the point being is, is that I realize they're trying to come out with this, to uh, b being in the state of adultery, of course. The real fundamental problem isn't even the question about the divorce and remarriage. The real question is, can you receive communion in the state of mortal sin? Well, St. Paul ended that discussion, right? That he who receives communion, in the, that he receives communion unworthily is guilty of the same, and he's referring to having crucified Christ. So it's, the church has always said it's morally sinful, it's one of the worst sins you can commit because it's sacrilege. And so the church has said, no, you can't, you're not to do that. You have to go to confession first. Okay. How do you explain the adaptations that can be visibly seen within a species? So we actually see this. So there are times in which, uh, um, in fact, this is something that maybe you or someone else can talk to a little bit more uh, directly. We obviously see, for example, among the deer population, there's all sorts of number of deer. Now, it's not like there were, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument, there's 40 different species of deer. It's not like they took all those deer onto the ark, right? So what would happen is, is that, they got, that God would actually take on this, the specific species onto the ark, and then after that, there's adaptations that occur. What does that mean? So the, I keep saying that the essence of a thing doesn't change. What a thing is doesn't change. So if they say, well, human beings will evolve out of their bodies, well, that's not a human being, because what a human being is is a body-soul composite, right? And so what constitutes a deer, the essence of the thing never changes. And so every single deer, regardless of size, hair color, all that, has the same essence or nature, right? Okay. Now, in the interesting thing, St. Thomas says that the only thing that we know the specific difference on ultimately is the human being. Because we know that human beings are different from other animals by virtue of the fact that we have reason. He said, when relationship to other animals, their accidental qualities are such, and our, the darkness of our intellect is such that we can't perfectly grasp what one species is and another. This is why, even within the scientific community, they can't even agree on what a species is and what species is which, right? But what that tells you is, is that in the same nature or essence, you can have something that has a variety of different, what we call accidental qualities. So the accidents are, is defined as, an accident is defined as that which exists in another as in a subject. What does that mean? The color of your hair doesn't change. If you were to change the color of your hair, you wouldn't say, oh, Bessie Sue had her hair colored. She's no longer human, right? You wouldn't say that. Because the color of our hair, the color of our skin, our race, even our gender, except these are accidents, and they're not the nature of who, uh, or the nature of what we are. Whereas the accidental, and this gives us an indicator that you can have a nature, <clears throat> such as human nature, that can have a variety of different kinds of accidental qualities. Because some people have long hair, some people, or some people have red hair, some people have brown hair, right? And they're all human. So the nature of humanity is the same, it's the same species. But we, all, we can have different accidental qualities. This is the same size. So for example, I always tell people the church is against birth control, but it is in favor of girth control, right? So you can have people who are much larger than other people, right? And doesn't mean that somehow or another they're less human or more human or what have you. Their essence remains the same, but the accidental qualities change. And that tells you that within a given essence, that they can have a variety of different accidents within a certain gamut, but there's certain accidental qualities they cannot have. 
So for example, a human being can have a specific color of hair, but we can't have the same accidental qualities as lead, right? So, and this gives us an indicator that different things have different accidental qualities that can exist within them. And so when, you're ta when you see, uh, when they talk about uh, uh, evolution, it's never a case of one species going to another. That's nowhere in any of the fossil records. There's no proof of that. In fact, it's, a, it's actually an impossibility based on a variety of different levels. But it is possible that within the confines of accidents for the animals to change over the course of time accidentally so that you can have those different accidents passed on in different locations. And this is why, say, a horse in one place is different from another or larger than another. This is why we have so many different kinds of different kinds of dogs is because these are accidentally different, but they're all ha part of the nature of a dog, right? And so it's, what, what that basically means is that you can have change, what they call sometimes ma uh, microevolution. You can have changes within the accidental qualities of things as long as it remains within that gamut but not within the species, which they call macroevolution. So we don't see one species becoming another. We just see that there's accidental qualities, changes within different species. So I just wanted people to get a sense of that. So when people point out, well, you know, the fruit fly is this and that, well, yeah, okay, that just means it's still all fruit flies. It's just that the accidental qualities will slightly change. And Hugh gave a great example of that last night about regarding the lizard, okay. So I'm, I'm going to try to go through a number of these. Uh, a number of people asked if the earth is flat. <laughs> no. No, God revealed that the earth is a sphere. And we have a book on our website. It's uh, only available as a PDF. It's called Flat Earth, Flat Wrong. And if you know somebody that has been deceived in this respect and they can't afford the $5 or whatever it is, we'll give it to them. Because Robertson Genis was not disrespectful to the flat earth thinkers. He took a tremendous amount of time to study their arguments, and he, rec he recognized that there are some very highly intelligent people who have come to believe in this, and he takes their arguments seriously, but he shows that they're wrong. And it is a pure myth that the church ever believed or taught a flat earth. There's practically unanimity among the fathers of the church that the earth is a globe. And the tradition of the church in her sacred art and iconography shows that the earth is a globe. So God would be deceiving us if he allowed this sacred art and iconography to teach us something that is not true. So, I hope that answers that question. A number of people asked about um, how to restore this traditional teaching on creation, and Father told us the most important part, which is to uh, live our faith. And we chose the Immaculate Conception as our principal patroness, even though we named the Kolbe Center after St. Maximilian Kolbe. And we believe that we must consecrate ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And then we must live that consecration in every moment. And we believe that when enough Catholics live our consecration to Jesus through Mary in every thought, in every word, 
and in every action, then that will constitute the triumph of the Immaculate Heart because the triumph of the Immaculate Heart is not something outside, it's something inside. And so when enough of us do this, then that will obtain the grace for everything else that she promised, including the ear of peace and the greatest evangelization the world has ever seen, the social reign of Christ our King. But we have materials that we can also use to help spread this truth. Um, the uh, DVD series Foundations Restored is being used by many, many families all over the world. There are priests all over the world who are showing it to their parishes, their homeschool co-ops that are using it. A bishop in Uganda has approved it as an official course and our webmaster is creating a website for the Soroti Diocese in Uganda. And if you get our email newsletter, which is free, we have the sign up downstairs. We'll let you know when that website is done. And then any Catholic in the world can go to their superiors and ask to take this course as a continuing education course because it's a diocesan approved course with the whole thing on the website and there are um, tests that you take after each episode to demonstrate that you understand the content and everything we have is on a suggested donation basis so if you can't afford the suggested donation which is $99 for the teacher's guide and 18 and a half hours worth of video we'll give it to you for whatever you can afford. And I don't know anybody that's watched the whole thing who hasn't been convinced. There was a very <laughs> intelligent young man who was extremely knowledgeable in the natural sciences whose mother asked him to watch it. And he told us later the only reason he agreed was so that he could tear it to pieces. But after he watched it with his mom, he became totally convinced. And now he goes to a traditional Catholic college, which is very good, except that <laughs> they teach theistic evolution. And he's been trying now to at least open up the discussion on campus. So we recommend that. And um, some people asked about science textbooks. Pamela Acker, our main biologist, was the primary author of a new biology textbook called Biology, a Catholic Perspective. And I believe it's the, the greatest science textbook ever written, at least in modern times. And I highly recommend it. It comes with the uh, laboratory manual and uh, exercises and the answer key. Unfortunately, I don't have any more copies with me, but you can find it on the website. That is really a tremendous asset. And hopefully in the future, if you get our newsletter, we're trying to publish more materials for young people. Hopefully we could publish textbooks in other areas of natural science. If you email me, I have a whole document with recommendations that I'm happy to send you, but it's too much for me to try to remember them all and give them to you now. Um, and then also on our website, we have some short videos. And for people that do not want to take the time to watch, say, even the first two episodes of Foundations Restored, which you can watch for free on the website foundationsrestored.com. You can see the first two episodes for nothing. Um, we have these shorter videos, and if you watch them with in, a, in the order that we recommend, in about one hour, you could really make an impact on a person, even like a 12-year-old child, 
who is willing to, to, to watch them because they really make the most important points in a, in a very short form. And we also have on the website some uh, what are called Darwin's documentaries, which are satires made by homeschooling Catholics, <laughs> which are hilarious, but they really do bring out <laughs> the fatal flaws in uh, evolution. So you can look for those, Darwin's documentaries. Um, okay, I, I, my time's probably up, right, for my round, or what would you say? Okay, but I just want to let Father Ripperger come back, and I'm losing track of the time. I'll just answer one other question, then when my turn comes again, I can go down the rest of my list. So a number of people asked about extreme weather, whether it's a consequence of sin or just climate change. And we've tried to make the point that the climate alarmists are basing their alarmism on a misinterpretation of scientific evidence about past conditions. So if we could get back to accepting God's revelation about the past, then we'd be able to interpret the evidence correctly about the future. But I do want to say that one of the many negative consequences of theistic evolution is that it makes God seem very remote and uninvolved in the creation. Whereas when we accept God at his word in Genesis as, our, as the fathers and doctors did, we know that we are the apple of his eye. He created everything for us and that he's always intimately involved. And that because he put man at the height of the hierarchy on earth, all the other creatures are subordinated. We're supposed to have dominion over them. We're supposed to care for them. But we are the ones who have been placed as masters over the creation. And so when we do not act according to God's will, then that creates a disorder and it does lead to natural disasters. So that when you read the lives of the saints, you see so many examples where they prophetically warned of natural disasters as a consequence of sin, like Saint Antonio Maria Claret, who was sent uh, to Cuba and found terrible disorders in the, in the church there. Um, and did an amazing job of restoring the faith, restoring the church. Um, there are examples where he warned people of earthquake as a chastisement for their sins. And then he, 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 he saw that when the people didn't repent from the earthquake, that there would be cholera. And this would then finally bring the people to repent. And he, he says that these things were the most effective preachers. <laughs> but the problem is the acceptance of evolution among Catholics has reached such a point that a terrible thing has happened. There are natural disasters and people don't see it as coming from God. And so they don't repent. And that is terrifying. And so that emphasizes the fact that we really have to intensify our prayers and the living of our consecration so that we can obtain the grace so that when terrible things happen as a consequence of sin, we are able to understand and see it as a call to repentance. I think I should stop there.
Uh, this was actually wrote, written to Hugh, and you may want to speak to it afterwards. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to take a shot at it. So, how can Adam live 900 years and know? Uh, and now lifespan is 85. So, what happened was, if you look at the actual account, so you know, uh, Methuselah I think lived to be 800 and 986 years or something like that. But they lived to be extremely old. And a lot of times, the modern scripture scholars come out and say, oh, well, they just calculated time differently. And I'm like, no, they didn't. Because actually, there's a specific point after the flood. God says man just sins too much, and he, in, in, he intentionally shortens man's life to a maximum of 120 years. And so, and then most people, 70, 80 years, and it's over, right? Several years ago, I was actually reading an article about the fact that they, you know, in the discussion, in the dis in the, they discovered that the aging process, um, part of the aging process, not the totality, but part of the aging process is at the end of your DNA are these things called polymers. And as you age, they begin to split. Now, when you're younger, if they split, the body has a mechanism, chemical mechanism, to reconnect those polymers. And that's what, so it's when your DNA remains intact that you actually are young. It's as they begin to split that, it, that you begin to age and your things just don't seem to work quite right, right? Okay. So, uh, when I was, I was reading this in, in the discovery, a few years before that they said if man didn't age, they did a study, they said if man didn't age, he would, his body would basically wear out somewhere between eight and 900 years if he didn't age. So what this probably is an indicator is, is that God actually changed our aging process at a certain point. They also, um, a, G, a team of geneticists uh, at the University of Southern California has discovered a way to extend human life to 800 years, possibly. There is a study that's being done right now. It's been, they've been very quiet about it. NASA realized if we're going to send people to Mars, there's going to be a lot of genetic damage that these people are going to suffer from all the radiation. So they, be, they basically did an extensive study to figure out exactly what it is in young people's body that causes their DNA to regenerate, and they figured it out. So they actually have, the initial study was actually done with um, mice. They would take old, very old mice who could hardly even walk, couldn't hardly get up, and they would take young mice, and then, but they would feed them this thing that they had figured out this is what it is caused. They give it to these mice. Within a week, they were keeping up with the young mice. They're now in the human clinical trials. People will pay big money for that. <laughs> okay. So anyway, the point is, is that it's actually literally true that they did live that long. And that at a certain point, God basically changed our aging process and cut our lifespan actually down. Now, I, I personally believe that part of being human is that you have to accept the punishment that's due to your sins. And I think trying to extend our life beyond these things, I mean, it's true and with illnesses, we always, God provided remedies in nature for, this is the whole point of St. Hildegard, he provided nature, uh, remedies in nature for our illnesses, so even though we get ill, you know, we're never going to cut that out, but we still have things that can help ameliorate that. Whereas aging, I think, is a different kind of an animal. I think to basically get to the point where we're not willing to accept the punishment of the aging as a result of our sins, I think that's problematic. I think it's unjust, frankly. The best way to help convert your husband. And <laughs> I'm going to lump that in with two more. When our priests are in error about, uh, about all of this, what are we supposed to do about it? And another one was, when are we going to get the Pope to tell the truth about this? Okay. <laughs> There's a positive and a negative to any form of conversion. The positive is people that to convert to see the truth of these matters, because they're supernatural in nature, you actually need grace to see the truth about them. So you have to do offer up your prayer, suffering, and good works for that grace so that they will see this. This is true even in relationship with the priests and this. You're going to have to do prayer, suffering, good works so they see the grace of the truth of special creation. You're also going to have to do this even in relationship to the Pope. I tell people, you know, in the, uh, the, before, it, they even inscripted by 1962, but in the 1944 version of the Missal, during Lent, there was a collect that was done 
every single day for the Pope. So literally the hundreds of thousands of masses offered around the world, there were hundreds of thousands of prayers said at mass for the Holy Father. We stop praying for the guy and then we wonder why he's acting weird. <laughs> you know, well, he's under attack and this is the, you have to be able to provide the grace for him to do the, those things that are right. And I, I say to myself, you know, if we get the leaders we deserve, what does that mean about us as a people that God would give us Joe Biden and Pope Francis? God love him. I mean, I, I do have a love for the Pope, but what does that mean? Right? Okay. So that's the positive side. You have to get the grace. This, the negative side is you got to keep demons out of people's hair because demons can influence people's thoughts and actually their um, emotions. And as a result, God can give people a subtle grace to, hey, maybe you should convert. And then the demons step in and then incite fear. Well, if you change, then this means this is going to happen. This is gonna... So you have to say binding prayers. And uh, one of the most effective things is consecrating the person every single day to Our Lady. A lot of times we'll keep the demons at bay so that they'll respond to grace and you'll see them slowly change. Um, and I think that's even true in relationship to getting the priest to teach about this. It is diabolic in the sense that the, what God, they, the demons have a particular hatred about how God created us and they don't want us to know it because in that creation, is a manifestation of how much he loves us. And that's one of the reasons why I think that evolution is so diabolic is because of the fact that it, it's like uh, Hugh just said, it, it distances God from us. Um, I would like the Catholic Church to come out strongly against transgenderism as it is in denouncing evolution. Will that occur? It's going to be a while. Before we get to transgenderism, in fact, one of the questions people actually had was what's the end game in all of that? What's the end game in the destruction of the sciences? Well, as far as the transgenderism goes, I think ultimately, um, first of all, it's, it's irrational, obviously. It's contrary to the evidence. Um, but it's also contrary to just how we understand it in, in human beings. And the people in charge that are pushing this know that. They know it's not rational. That's exactly why they're pushing it. Because their goal is to weaken us. Part of communism is to, you have to tear people down psychologically in their identity, both in their, um, their national identity, their regional identity. You have to tear them down in their own psychological identity because once you get them that weak, then you can control them. This is also the end game as to why all the sciences are collapsing and in the sense that, and why the sciences are at, real scientists are under attack, because real science leads you to the truth. And that's the last thing they want. If you know the truth, then you're gonna stand in opposition to what they're trying to propose. So I think that that's, it. will the church ever denounce it? Eventually. But I think there's gonna to have to be a series of things the church is gonna to have to address. Someone asked, you know, is evolution the only error of Russia? No, I, there's a whole series of errors of Russia, but one of them is feminism itself. If you read, some of you might have heard this, let me say this, if you read the interview of Clara Zenkin of Vladimir Lenin, it's right online. You could lift out the names and it would sound like they were, that they were basically interviewing Nancy Pelosi. There is no difference. It is the full, he lays out the whole structure of modern feminism, which you might have heard me say is basically just the curse of Eve on steroids, right? And so they're the ones that are pushing this. So they're going to have to condemn the, the feminism because it's contrary to the nature of, of true femininity and to the nobility of motherhood. They're going to have to, con and I think that's part of the reason against the transgenderism because in transgenderism, when people go through transgender surgery, they end up sterile. So it's anti-life. It also, the transgender stuff is also to tear down our understanding of clear distinctions. This is one of the reasons why in the past, you could always see the degradation in a culture when the, because um, transgenderism is not anything new. Now the surgeries are, but the transgender stuff is not new. You even see there's, there's talks in the Roman period about guys dressing up as women, etc. So this has been around for a while. It's just that now it's gotten off the ground and so, I think that it's the, the ultimate goal is the destruction of true femininity and motherhood specifically, the nobility and magnificence of the office of motherhood. And it's also the destruction of masculinity 
and true patriarchy and its benefits. I think that's its ultimate destructive goal because you tear down any semblance of what it means to be a man or to be a woman. I, I get such a gas, I'll try and shut up here so Hugh can get up, but I, I uh, get such a gas out of these guys you know, that are transgenders who are going and playing in women's sports. And then to prove the point, you get this guy who's the dead weight lifter champion and then he, full beard, says, I'm a woman today, crushes all the women's things, and then the next day says, no, I'm a guy again, you know. And then they're like, you have to call me by my pronouns. Well, what's going to happen if you get a guy who claims to be a woman but still wants to use male pronouns? I mean, that's what's coming next. I mean, it's just all silly. Okay. Uh, and I'll let you up here. Someone asked how we can know that the days of Genesis 1 were 24-hour days since God is outside of time. So uh, I tried to explain yesterday that God, of course, is outside of time and he could have created the world in any period of time that he chose. But time is the measure of change and all the fathers and doctors teach that once God created creatures, time came into existence. St. Thomas says, even if there were only angels, there would be time because of a succession of their acts. So why did he create everything in six 24-hour days and consecrate the seventh day? Because he loves us, and from the very beginning, by the very way that he created the world, he gave us the rhythm by which we must live if we want to live a happy, healthy, holy life. And a lot of the illness, both spiritual and physical, of the modern world flows directly from not obeying this rhythm. And think about it. Do you think that people would show more respect for the Lord's day? if they believed that God created everything in six days and consecrated the seventh day and that the church transferred the Lord's day to Sunday, not only because it is the day of the resurrection, but for all Christians, it was also the first day of creation when God created the heavens and the earth and created the light and the angels and separated the light from the darkness, of course. And when Our Lady came to La Salette, she was weeping mainly because of two sins, blasphemy against the name of God and a violation of the Lord's day. Do you think it's a coincidence that Charles Lyell published his book at almost the exact time that Our Lady of Salat appeared? It's not a coincidence. Because once people began to think that geology proved that the earth was thousands and then hundreds of thousands and then millions of years old, that's when they denied, they began to deny that God created everything in six days. But we must realize that in Hebrew, the word yom, which is the Hebrew word for day, when it's used with the phrase evening and morning, it always means a 24-hour day. There are no exceptions. And Maimonides was like the Thomas Aquinas of the Jewish tradition in the Middle Ages. He summed up the tradition of biblical interpretation within the Jewish people from the beginning. And he's categorical. Yom means a 24-hour day. And he's also categorical that the, while the days of creation week were 24-hour days, yet it was a totally supernatural creation. So that's not only our tradition from the apostles, it's our tradition going back to the very beginning of salvation history. 
Um, let me just ask, uh, ask, let me just answer one last question, and please feel free to email me. We, we won't refuse to answer any question, and I'm happy to refer you to one of our scientists if uh, I can't answer it. But a number of people asked about Galileo, and uh, a priest friend of mine who uh, was in graduate school in biochemistry before he entered the priesthood, he told me how he remembered that they had faculty meetings and the professors were very concerned because quite a few of the students seemed to believe in this biblical creation and they were really upset about it. So this one professor said, just mention Gal Galileo, that shuts them up every time. And at the Second Vatican Council, when Cardinal Suenens wanted his brother bishops to open up to contraception, he said, science has given us a new understanding of what is according to natural law. Please, my brothers, we don't want another Galileo affair. So the devil has been using this tactic very effectively for a long time. And yet the reality is, if you study the history, the church handled the Galileo affair perfectly because all educated people like St. Robert Bellarmine and the church knew that the Ptolemaic model of the solar system was inadequate. But what many people don't realize is that the greatest astronomer of that age was not Copernicus, was not Galileo, it was Tycho Brahe. And Tycho Brahe formulated on the basis of more actual observations of the heavens that had ever been made than had ever been made in at least in recent history, he formulated the model which had the planets going around the sun and the sun going around the earth. And the greatest astronomers in the church were the Jesuit astronomers, and they preferred the system of Tycho Brahe to the system of Galileo because it could accommodate all the astronomical observations, but it, it didn't deny the literal and obvious sense of scripture, which clearly taught that the earth was not moving and was at or close to the center of the universe. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but St. Hildegard of Bingen, who was made a doctor of the church by Pope Benedict, was shown by God the constitution of the universe, and she was shown the same model of the solar system that Tycho Brahe arrived at through his examination of the heavens. Now, what are the odds that St. Hildegard of Bingen would have been shown that model of the solar system and that the greatest astronomer of the age of Galileo and Copernicus would formulate it independently based on astronomical observations. If you look at our materials, especially our new DVD series, How the World Was Made in Six Days, you'll see that the actual observational evidence is more consistent with Tycho's model and St. Hildegard's model than with any other model to this day. And more and more observational data is confirming that that model is the best one, the one that God revealed to us. And this is also related to the question that a number of people asked about the light. How can the universe be only 6,000 years, 7,000 years, if we're seeing light from galaxies that are billions of light years away. Well, you have to understand that the fact that we see light coming redshifted 
in every direction around the earth is already an indication that we're in a central position. Edwin Hubble recognized this, and the only reason he rejected that interpretation was because he said, it's unacceptable for us to be in the center. That's just not, we can't have that. And so that led to all the things that people are being taught today. But light can be redshifted for a number of different reasons. And the, if you email me, I can send you the best explanation for the redshift, which is explained within a framework where the Earth is in a central position. And what's happening is the light is being affected by gravity from where it's originating. And it's redshifting, and that's why we're seeing all this light redshifted. But the, the, the speed of light can far exceed the speed of light as we measure it here on Earth, as even Einstein admitted in his general theory of relativity. And when you interpret the evidence within the framework of the Neo-Ticonian model, which has the Earth at the center and the planets going around the sun and the sun going around the Earth, you can explain very well how that light could be transmitted from very distant galaxies almost instantaneously. So it's too much to try to explain it now, <laughs> but if you uh, email me, I can send you to the links. And if you get the first DVD that we have downstairs, which is day one of how the world was made in six days, you'll already begin to get a good understanding of this. So thank you very much. Yes, yeah. uh, yeah, so, and, and if it would be possible to organize another one of these conferences in the near future, then we could go into a lot more depth in a number of these areas. Okay, the first question, or the first thing is, uh, give us one of your father's one-liners. <laughs> so I used to work as a mechanic uh, w around my father, and one day, this was just, just as I was, I was actually a subdeacon at the time, and he just said to me, the problem, he, I mean, just out of the blue, he just says, the problem with the modern priesthood is there's no more men left in it. He, he was brutal, okay. Uh, is receiving organs from an organ harvesting not moral since organs was removed when the donor was still alive when they were removed? There are three kinds of organs. There are organs that are twinable, so like you can take a part of the liver and it will, that part will grow back and you can take some part of that liver, do that. So they can, you can get, receive those legitimately. Obviously, we're presuming that you're not getting them from China, all right? Okay, the second one is um, those which are twinned, such as kidneys. So you could donate a kidney and actually get that. That would be legitimate. And then there's those that are neither twinnable nor twinned, and those, um, it would be immoral to actually receive them because the person has to be alive in order to take them. Okay. Uh, how old does the church believe God's creation uh, was created. The general consensus is somewhere between six and 10,000, 10,000 on the very outside, but the most it's somewhere around 6,000, okay. Um, we are truly living in an age of miracles then, aren't we? We will see God raising up the greatest saints, won't we? Uh, I hope so. After all, as we have devolved, God has further to lift us up, heroic virtue, further to go. Okay, your thoughts. Yes, I do actually see that. I'm seeing there's, um, there's some of the, especially among the young, there's certain graces that we've been starting to see here for about the last 10 or so years. 
you're seeing graces that are kind of extraordinary. I mean, there's, um, and so God is giving the people the grace to kind of get things straightened out. However, I do also think that it's going to, um, the saints, I mean, we're going to go through a time of persecution, so we're going to be seeing a lot of that, and we still, we'll see some of the greatest saints. I think we're already seeing some of them. But we're going to, uh, it's going to be very brutal. And then um, the air of peace, which is supposed to be, I mean, there's all sorts of theories about all this stuff, but um, Our Lady said that there would be 25 years of good harvest after the chastisement when she appeared in La Salette. So once we get spanked, um, I think you'll see a lot of things change for the better. Um, but in the meantime, I think you're going to see God use this uh, situation. The situation is bad. It's very grave, but it can also be used for your sanctification if you're willing to suffer. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is a call to penance. You know, one of the things is Christ said that in relationship, he says, because the apostle said, why couldn't we get these demons out? And he said, well, there's certain demons that can only be cast out by prayer and uh, um, fasting. And so one of the things we're going to have to, what we really need to do is we need to do uh, penance on a variety of different levels. But I think in relationship to this specific topic, we do need to do penance for the sake of the priests and the clergy and the church to be able to um, readopt that and see the truth of special creation. The second thing is that we also need to do it, obviously, for the, for the pro-life situation and all of that. Um, and then we also, I think, just need to do it in general. So penance really should be the call today. So I would really encourage you to do penance so that the people who hear this message will actually accept it and be open to it. Because, A, we gotta, it's like anything else. We've got to keep the demons out. But then also we need, they need to receive the grace so that when they hear this truth, they'll be willing to accept it. Okay. And so uh, what I'm going to do is give you a final blessing. Benedicto de omnipotentis, patris et fili et spiritus sancti, descendit super vos et maniat semper. Amen.